and you know there there could be these connections uh, could be part of the influence of why during the time of Jesus Ethiopia was still sent trade people to Jerusalem. You know the Ethiopian eunuch, um, probably on a trade mission. Um, they apparently maintain those open lines all the way through. Okay. All right, so let's go along, since we're on this Queen of Sheba. One of my other points is um, looking for verses that seem out of place. So the other one was uh, looking for cultural things that you're not really sure about, right? So we don't know what Ziv is, and so the assumption is, well, that's just a Hebrew month, right? But anytime you don't know something, you want to look it up because your assumption could be wrong. So on Ziv, that would have been wrong. Normally when people read right over that, since they're not real familiar with the Hebrew months, they would just assume that was whatever they called it and they'd go on. But it kind of shows you the influence that Phoenicia was beginning to have on that region because they were now governing their time by Phoenician months um, when they're talking about the building of the temple. So that was that one. This one is looking for verses that seem out of place. So let's go to 1 Kings chapter 10. So, it doesn't necessarily say that the Queen of Sheba was just on uh, business, right? Uh, but there's kind of an interesting passage in here. So let's, um, we'll start in verse 9. So 1 Kings 10, verse 9. So this is a little before the part that we want, but just to kind of put it into context. It says, Blessed be the Lord God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. This is her talking to Solomon. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king, that you may execute justice and righteousness. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, so that's about 20 tons of gold, um, very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Um, in fact, gold, spices... And stones. That is the same three things. Not to get too off track, but I'm just I'm thinking about it right now. In Genesis, the Bible says that there's a river that comes out of Eden that goes through that called Pishon that goes through the land, and where that river goes, there's three things. There's gold, onyx, which is a precious stone, and bedlam. But bedlam is is a resin produced by a plant that they would burn for incense. And so it's just kind of interesting, just as I'm reading that here, um, that the three things that she brought, the gold, the spices, and the stones, are the same three things uh, from that Pishon River coming out of Eden. But So that's something else. It's just something I'm reading. All right. Never again came such an abundance of spices uh, as the Queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. Moreover, the fleet of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought from Ophir a very great amount of amalgam wood and precious stones. And the king made of the amalgam wood uh, supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Um, and then it goes back in in verse 13 and starts talking about Queen of Sheba again. And then King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked. And so it's talking about the Queen of Sheba and Solomon, and then all of a sudden stops and starts talking about Ophir, which is where Sheba is, and the trade route that all of a sudden is established. And it's saying that Hiram was able to, with this thing that Solomon had sent down, him and Hiram had sent down into this land to bring back all of these resources and gold on a trade mission. And that is placed right in the midst of two discussions of the Queen of Sheba. So the Queen of Sheba is before that verse, and then the Queen of Sheba goes back to her again after that. And so uh, I don't believe it's an accident then that the trade route established that Hiram used to bring all of this gold into Israel and all of 
uh, a bunch of this other types of wood that was used in the making of many of Israel's projects here, I think there's a connection uh, between that and what's going on here with Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, right? You see that, that, that right in the middle, even though it doesn't say anything about her, it has placed Hiram's uh, transactions with that same region right in the middle of the story about this peace that Solomon is making with the Queen of Sheba. And so I believe that's not an accident, that, that this trade that Hiram is able to do for the wood and for the gold uh, is probably connected in some way to this mission that the Queen of Sheba is on. Right? That at the same time that Hiram is down there on behalf of Israel, getting all of this gold and this wood, now you see someone on behalf of them coming to Israel um, to interact with Solomon. And so it seems like what we have here is not just a random queen who just showed up in Israel, but we have the makings of two national trade parties here, right? That that whole region down there is interacting with Solomon and Hiram's mission down there, and at the same time, they're sending people up to Solomon uh, to see his nation with gifts and all of this kind of stuff, that I don't think it was an accident that she just happened to stumble upon him, that these, these are probably very strategic things between two nations uh, to open up trade. Right. Yeah, to, to open up, um, they pro because back then, you didn't have the quickness of trade that you have today. So if I need something that's only made in China, I can have it in a couple of days. You know, I can just buy it and have it shipped here. Back then, they didn't have that. So you only had a certain number of plants that grew in your region. If you wanted to have anything else, it was grown somewhere else. You had to make a trade with them. And so you'd get areas like Solomon that had tons of wheat, and then maybe some areas like this lady that had tons of gold, and so, but maybe they didn't have the farming that Solomon had there. And so they're wanting to make some trades, right? And so I think that's what this whole Queen of Sheba story is, um, is a trade. And so sticking with this, that passage about Hiram trading with Ophir and having all of this success in business with Ophir placed right in the middle of the story of the Queen of Sheba is not an accident. So that's why I say sometimes looking for verses that seem out of place is an important study tool because they're often not out of place. That there's often a connection between the two thoughts. So if you just read over that, it looks like it's moving from the story of the Queen of Sheba now to the story of Hiram and his trading um, and then back to the story of the Queen of Sheba. But in reality, I think all of that is connected, that those stories are intertwined. I know in the scripture there talks about how they, they built the ships that they used for that trade uh, on the shores of the Red Sea. Yeah. Ophir, so if you have Saudi Arabia, all right, and then this is uh, the Sinai Peninsula, and this is Saudi Arabia here, and then this is the Red Sea, right? This area down here at the bottom, and then, and then Africa then kind of comes down this way. So Ethiopia is here, and then just right across this water, it's not as big as my drawing is making it seem. Um, this water here, and then this water here. Uh, Connecting these two from this region here and to this region here is not a whole lot of water. So all of this was Ethiopia back then. And so they're landing actually in southern Saudi Arabia. This is where the, a lot of the, this is where Ophir most likely was. And a lot of the strongholds of Sheba was actually in southern Saudi Arabia and then on the shores of Africa over here. And so they're probably building their ships in this region here somewhere and then shipping them down that same route which by the way is crossing over where the Israelite Red Sea crossing was when they went into Sinai over here uh, <coughs> they would have been sailing through that same area which is kind of neat. Uh, trade goods up to there probably and then and then Solomon had peace with these people. They weren't under subjection. 
you know, Edom and, and Midian and whoever's there, you know. And then they brought it on land the rest of the way. And so they're sending people down here because the Bible says that the wood and the gold that Hiram was using, he ended up getting from down here. And at the same time, the story is also talking about, up oh, the Queen of Sheba is up here. And so I believe that there is a connection between these two stories, right, of what's going on down there and what's going on here, uh, particularly when we know that often the queens were sent as emissaries uh, for, the, for these Arabian people uh, during that time. Afterwards, not so much. You know, kind of how now the women there don't have much of a standing. It wasn't always that way. So during the time of the Queen of Sheba, I want to say, I, I read somewhere that up until about 600 BC, queens were used by the, in these regions as emissaries. After that time, the, you know, it's, it's more like how it is today, where the women didn't hold positions in these Arabian nations. But, but up until about 600 BC, which would cover the time of Solomon, he was he was 940. Um, that that was a common practice. So it's probably not just that some queen just happens to leave and just stumbles upon Solomon's area. Um, I mean, obviously we knew she knew about him already, but it's more than just her wanting to see. You know, it, it almost comes across as just a curiosity, you know, but I believe it's more than that, that it was a mission to create goodwill, you know, between the two areas. Yeah, so you've got this area here. Um, yeah, so it's, it's hard to say which way. I don't know enough of their history to know whether they started here and went this way or whether they started this way and came down. You know. And so this was not called Ethiopia. I'm calling it Ethiopia at this point. Um, it was called Sheba at that time. So it, was, it covers areas in Africa that today we call Ethiopia. Okay. I don't have too much more time. Um, Yeah, so that's another thing that, you know, a lot of times people, I mean, this, this is a thousand miles uh, from Israel to Sheba. Um, and so that's, that's the other thing is people say, oh, well, who could make a trip that way? And that's probably why the queen was sent. You know, the kingdom wanted to travel a thousand miles, you know. Um, and then if they weren't friendly, he's not in danger, you know, because if he's going to go there, he'd pretty much have to bring his army in order to not be in danger. So it's probably why they were sending the queen. Uh, but there are other stories of the Persians uh, with trade routes that were 16 and 1700 miles long. So this is long, um, but not so long that it's out of the realm of what was going on back then. Particularly if there was a boat route that they could make that a little faster with the boat route. Okay. The Phoenicians Yeah. The Phoenicians were boat people. Yeah. Right. And so uh, from there because I mean they're a port city, Tyre Side and those areas up there, they were into boats. So they were probably very influential because it says Hiram was the one that actually brought this boat back. So they're probably very influential with setting up a deal with Solomon of saying, hey, we know how to build boats that can make this trip. We can go down there and get all of these sources from down there. And this is the same area that um, frankincense is grown here. And there's not many places in the world that frankincense is grown from. And so this is one of the two regions that kind of gets the possibility of when it says wise men from the east came with the frankincense, that they're thinking potentially this southern Arabia part uh, is possible. The other one is there is a story in China at that same time that their astrologers had noticed uh, a star that they had been waiting for 
And so the emperor in China, uh, at that same time of Christ, sent people um, to go find the star of, because their original thing was very much like uh, like a Hebrew form, just without the specifics of the law that Moses had. So think back to the patriarchs or something like that, how they worship the one true God and they built altars and they even had their uh, a single day of atonement in their history um, and things of that nature um, that they you know that they celebrated and worshipped the, the they had a spotless bull or something like that that was part of their annual day of of forgiveness for the nation and all that kind of stuff and they worshipped the one true God for a while and then that kind of got corrupted um, but so anyways up until the time of Christ they were kind of they were slipping into idolatry but still had known some of the things from before and and they were very much into watching the stars in China so anyways they they tell a story of the star that they had been waiting for appearing and so uh, the emperor sent men with gifts over to the east to try and find where the star was. Um, so that would be the two main stories, either somewhere down here or the, the Chinese embassy that was sent over. All right, so let me give you another one here real quick. Um, look for phrases, and this is kind of sometimes easier said than done, but the, the more you get familiar with the Old Testament, the easier it is to find it in the New Testament. So looking for phrases uh, in the New Testament that are similar to phrases from the Old Testament. Okay, so let me give you an example. There's there's a million of these that they're sometimes we call them allusions. Sometimes they're actual quotes. Um, but one that I think is kind of interesting. Um, turn to Leviticus chapter four. So, everybody there, Leviticus 4.1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commands about these things not to be done, and does any of them, if it is the anointed priest who, sin who sins, thus bring guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. Um, go down to verse 13. If the whole congregation of Israel sins, then he tells them what they need to do. Uh, verse 22. When a leader sins, doing intentionally any of the things that the commandments of the Lord God ought not to be done, he realizes guilt, he needs to act, offer this sacrifice. Uh, verse 27, 427. If any one of the common people sins, then he tells them what they need to do. Uh, for Leviticus 5. Verse 1, if anyone sins that he hears a public adjuration to testify and tells them what he needs to do. Um, 514, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally, this is what he shall do. Uh, 517, if anyone sins during any of these things by the Lord's commandments, and tells what he uh, should do. Leviticus 6, 1, if anyone sins, so... Anyway, so you see the pattern. If anyone sins, and then God gives them the, the sacrifice, the offering that they are give in order to receive forgiveness. So God gives a variety of different sins. So that is the formula. If you sin, depending on who you are or whatever, there is a specific way that you receive forgiveness. Right. So then now go to the New Testament, 1 John. chapter 2, right? So 1 John chapter 2. He says, My little children, 
I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have the Father, Jesus Christ, righteous. So it is the same formula from Leviticus. That's what he's talking about here. Is All the way through Leviticus, it says, if anyone sins, you must offer this to receive forgiveness. If anyone sins, you offer that to receive forgiveness. If you commit sin, you offer that to receive forgiveness. That's the pattern of that section of Leviticus. So when John comes in and writes him, and he uses that specific phrase, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, he's saying there is no more need for the sacrifices anymore. That he's intentionally quoting from Leviticus, which said if you sin, you need these sacrifices. Now John is saying if anyone sins, it's about the advocate we have with the Father. And so that sheds a lot of light on what he means by that passage, that he, it is a direct comparison with the Old Testament, even word for word. You know, if anyone sins, this is what he does. So that's an example of a phrase. So it's not a quote, right? It's just that phrase, if anyone sins. So a direct quote in the New Testament, you obviously want to go back to the Old Testament where it comes from and kind of do some research on that. This is going to a, a slightly different way that you're not just talking about a quote of a scripture, but it is a phrase that is in the New Testament that is also in the Old Testament. And so that phrase in this one is, if anyone sins, he should, you know, and then that is the Old Testament phrase. And we find it now in the New Testament. And so that kind of sheds light um, on what John is trying to get them to see. He even goes on Right, that he is the propitiation of our sins. So what happened to the Catholics? They forgot that. Yeah, I know. And uh, and he says, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Right, because in in the Old Testament, it was very specific. Uh, If a priest sins, he should do this. If one of the commoners of Israel sins, he should do this. They were all about what happens if Israel sins. Right. And so he is broadening it, and it was specific people within it. So he says, if anyone sins, but then he also broadens it, because originally the Old Testament reference was just to Israel. And he says, uh, but not only for us, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, and so, so that's really what he's, he's going over in that part. Okay. All right, I think we are out of time. So let's pray.